Uh, good morning. This is uh, Arlen Myers. I'm with the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs, and welcome to another session of our SOAP School, where we're talking about artificial uh, intelligence entrepreneurship and in healthcare. Um, these sessions are offered the second Tuesday of every month, seven o'clock Mountain Time. And this is the fourth one. So um, I uh, encourage you and thanks for participating. So uh, we're pleased to have our friend and uh, uh, colleague, uh, Ty uh, Hagler, who uh, is an expert in design thinking, who's going to walk us through some uh, things on his mind. And Ty, thanks a lot for doing this. Hey, I appreciate the invitation. And uh, so I will say for those people who are joining via their Firefly uh, transcriptions, uh, this is going to be an interactive session. So um, you're missing out because this is going to be something where we're going to be spending some time and actually engaging with the content. Uh, so I have dropped a link in here to the mural board we'll be working from today. And if you are joining late, uh, you know, I'll drop the link in one more time. Uh, but ask you to go ahead and log in. Um, you want to join as a visitor um, and also thoroughly encourage making a mess because uh, it's this is entirely here for us to play with and explore ideas and try out new techniques. I do think that all of these AI tools we're coming across need to be played with so that you learn kind of what its strengths and weaknesses are. And so this is something I'd like for us to engage with as a workspace. And then also go ahead and log in to your favorite large language model, whether it's ChatGPT or whatever the Microsoft, Google, Twitter, kind of whatever your favorite large language model is. And we're going to be pushing some prompts into that as part of engaging with the content today. So those two things I want you to go ahead and log into the mural board and then your favorite chat interface. With that, I'll go ahead and start on some of the content for today. And then we will uh, jump out and do the exercise. OK. So with that, so today we're going to be talking about something. I'm, I'm trying to coin a term with this, but uh, empathy first artificial intelligence. And so it's the application of design thinking in healthcare innovation. And so that's largely what we want to talk about here today. And let's see, endeavor to get through it. I've got more content to get through than we have time. So uh, also, if we want to direct uh, kind of if we decide we want to like dig into one or more of these topics, let's drill down because I want it to be something that's useful for everybody here on the call. OK, so we think about design thinking and really, I think of the best analog for that would be poker. Because with poker, you have a decision to make, which is do you put all of your chips in on a bet? which I think if you're trying to approach things from approach innovation from a rationalist viewpoint, then you say, you know what, we've identified an opportunity, therefore we're going to put all, commit all of our resources to this, and we're just going to either make it big or not, versus an empiricist then is looking for additional data. So we're betting and calling and trying to manage our downside risk by making acceptable loss bets. And so smart poker players have a lot in common with design thinking. But ultimately, this comes back to this question of how much confidence do we have in our decision making? And I think confidence is an interesting and dangerous word, particularly when, when, when we are engaging with new domains. And that comes into the principle of Dunning-Kruger, which with the Dunning-Kruger effect, it's a cognitive bias where people with low expertise and experience in a new domain tend to overestimate their ability or knowledge. And so anytime you're engaging with innovation, you are subject to Dunning-Kruger, meaning that your confidence level is going, to, is going to spike because you have a lot of expertise from one domain and we're entering into a new domain. We're going to say, this is going to be easy. I'm going to flip this business in two years. This is going to be like, you know, a multi-million billion dollar market opportunity. And we start climbing the peak of Mount Stupid. And then as you actually go through in the commitment of following through on this, then you drop into the valley of despair as reality starts to kick in of you don't actually know as much as you think you know. And then eventually you start working your way through and climbing the slope of enlightenment before you eventually reach the plateau of sustainability where your expertise and confidence really kicks in. So this is something that is humbling because each of us humans tend to do this regardless of your background. And so it's just identifying this at the outset when we're approaching novel innovation uh, efforts. 
So this also happens to look very similar to the Gartner hype cycle, which you think about like basically the overall like peak of like overemphasis um, when we have new technologies coming into the forefront. And so they're mapping, I guess, basically like how much, how many people are climbing Mount Stupid on each of these different new AI tools. And so it's fascinating to see kind of how uh, Gartner has been able to use a methodology to say, how much longer do we have on each of these AI technologies that are in early stages of development before they reach peak hype cycle? And so right now you think about generative AI where we are currently as of July, 2023, when this was created is kind of at the peak. And so we're gonna start seeing the, I guess, the collapse of all of this enthusiasm that's been, uh, that's been created around these large language models. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that we've been trying a lot of things. And so eventually we're going to figure out like what are the real value that's created with this. And so just as humans engaging with new technology, we're going to continue to see this type of behavior as we look at what's coming down from the future in terms of quant uh, quantum computing, other like big new technologies that are emergent. But I think it's interesting to kind of see where that's coming. So I if yes. I can ask a question, is it okay to ask questions? Yeah, absolutely. Love questions. Uh, so the flip side of this is people don't accept that they don't know what they don't know. And so how do you get people to acknowledge that they don't know what they don't know? Uh, some people you just can't tell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you just have to, you're, I mean, like reality eventually sneaks up on you and has a way of humbling you. And some people can push reality back further and further into the future, but eventually it catches up with you. So uh, otherwise we try to work with people who have that level of humility to accept what we don't know. And Sri, Sri, do you have an answer? Yes. No, actually I was going to ask an analogous question, which was when do you know you're in one of these cycles? Is it self-realized or does somebody else have to point it out to you? How does that work? Um, so I think with, and uh, that's such a great question. Um, so I think anytime you're engaging in a new domain, really you're, and so this is every single design project I've ever done is that we have gone through and scoped out, hey, we're going to create this thing for a client. And therefore we think it's going to take, oh, it's going to be a five week uh, project. We think it's going to take this much time. We've got the scope bounded. And then you actually go through and meet reality. And that takes twice as long as you expected. And you meet these complications. And customers actually think something completely differently when you engage with it. So I think any time you're engaging in a new domain where you don't actually know if it's going to work or you're not, if you don't have a data set behind you of we've seen all of this history that can then offer us a predictive model of what comes next. Rather, if, if it's innovation, then that should mean that you're subject to Dunning-Kruger. Because by definition, nobody's done it before. You're doing it in a new domain, and you're going to overestimate your ability to achieve the innovation just by definition. I don't know if that helps, right? Yeah. So I call this the kitchen renovation effect. Thanks. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you've ever renovated a kitchen, which I have, I haven't, but I mean, we've done it. Uh, Inevitably, it's going to cost twice as much as you thought. It's going to take twice as long to do it. It's going to be impossible to find anybody to find, to do it and do it right. And when it's all done, you're not going to be satisfied anyway because they put the electric switch like upside down or on the wrong wall or whatever. So I think the answer to my question is uh, because you don't take personal responsibility from your experience. I mean, all of us have done stuff where we thought we knew what the heck we were doing. I don't care whether it's surgery or renovating a kitchen, but things go south pretty routinely. Mm -hmm. And and yet we continue to th think Lake Wobegon. Every surgeon thinks they're better than average. So, I, I, and I think the reason is that we don't take personal responsibility for A, not overestimating our abilities and B, not accepting the consequences of mistakes. Mm -hmm. we, we blame it on other people. I mean, it's a fact of life. Now, why some people accept it and other people don't is a very long conversation in psychology, which we don't have time to go into, but those are just my thoughts. Right.
Yeah, no, we can probably spend the whole lecture on this, but go ahead, Sri. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ty, but just to build on what Arlen said, being aware that these two effects are in place uh, going forward, what can you do from a cognitive or design thinking standpoint to kind of address these and build you know, uh, some leeway for the fact that these will come into the picture at some point? I'm assuming you'll be addressing some of that in the lecture, but I just wanted to put this out there. Yeah, well, and I think that comes down to uh, forming, so rather than um, safety from failure, rather design experiments that are safe to fail, meaning that if they fail, they're not going to kill you or anybody else, that you can, it would, it's only a, a fraction of your total resource to achieve a goal, and you want to fail quickly to succeed sooner. And so building a positive relationship with failure so that you're doing good failures versus bad failures. So a bad failure, it would basically like might be a good result from a bad process, like going to Vegas and taking your entire home mortgage and placing it all on black on the blackjack table and say, good luck. You know, so 50, 50 odds, you either like, you know, double your money or come home with zero, right? And so if, if you have a good result from that, that's actually a bad thing because then you're going to try to do that again until eventually the odds don't go in your favor. And so I think being able to run good process where you can limit your downside risk, but also maximize your learning, I think is kind of the ultimate, you know, kind of principle from design thinking that happens to apply to like good poker players too. Uh, so Anyway, I can touch on some more of these principles, but um, you know, one of the things that jumped out at me, and this is actually how I came across uh, Ben Schneiderman's work uh, called Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, where he's coined this term. He actually published the book in 2022, but it's something that's an emerging principle that we see coming out and really sparked an entire investigation I had into what is it that this gentleman and this professor uh, like had developed in terms of human-centered AI. So I want to touch on that over the course of this uh, lecture here. And also, um, I think it's interesting because he was one of the early founders of the internet. And the reason why any of your hyperlinks are blue is a design choice that he made as he was formulating the internet. So he you know, dates back to early stages of the internet to then be forward looking and figuring out, I, we've, emerged, we've seen all of these different uh, software tools emerge. And so where do we see it going from here? Okay, so I wanna touch on a couple of topics. I don't know if we're gonna get to writing good need statements. That's probably a lecture in its own right. So we're gonna get into what is design thinking in the first place. Let's talk about empathy first AI, and then some prototypes within AI that I've been playing with personally that you all might find interesting. And then we can touch upon writing good need statements, which is a foundational skill to empathy first AI. So we'll see if we can touch on some of this, but I love questions too. So I jump in with them and we can have a conversation if any of these spark discussion. Okay. All right, so with that, so let's talk about, you know, what is design thinking in the first place? Uh, so I like to relate design thinking to empirical creativity. So it's knowledge gained through experience of the world, trial and error, and not only through reason and rationality, that we have to allow for the illogic uh, to uh, let the, you know, as you think about Leonardo da Vinci, and you know some of the sculpture that he created and the paintings that he created, he allowed the material to speak to him and see the statue emerge uh, from the stone rather than purely coming in with a plan and having to force it into the, the medium that he had. And so some things to, to consider is that design thinking is a mindset and it's a framework for solving problems. It's not fail safe, predictable or linear. And we're making a value judgment with design thinking by prioritizing the customer's needs, the stakeholder's needs above all else. So we're asking us to consider first what's desirable, then feasible or financial viability or you know, any other consideration. First, we're saying, does it actually do any good? And then we go forward and try to figure out how to justify that good we've, we've identified. It's also iterative and hands-on. You'll probably see me using my hands quite a bit that like I want us to also do hands-on practical application of this because that's the only way you can gain experience with these tools and make sure you're deepening your knowledge and coming up with new and novel techniques as a result. Okay, 
So an example of some of our work, uh, so we teach uh, design thinking to clinicians and uh, uh, physicians. And so one of the teams that we've worked with, uh, Team Respiro, uh, was looking at the problem of first responders needing a tool to differentiate causes of shortness of breath. And so along the way, this was our prototype that emerged from storyboarding, which I think of storyboarding as the most common layer for any type of innovation where you can get your first prototype done to test an idea and get feedback on it. So here in this example, we've got an AI uh, suggested machine learning model that takes three different sensor inputs and then uses a learning machine learning tool to then provide a probability of this being COPD versus heart failure versus pneumonia as a, as a predictive tool for emergency room first responders. So the neat thing about this is they didn't actually go through and build out this tool and the solution, but they were able to go through and test it at basically the cost of generating some storyboards to then identify that another startup in Silicon Valley was already several million dollars ahead of them. And so this particular embodiment didn't make sense, which is why we have a release to show this. Uh, but it was neat to say that they were able to save themselves millions of dollars investments, not pursuing an idea that ultimately wouldn't pan out. And so therefore that it freed them up to pursue the next big idea that they're working on. So it's neat to kind of see that this can help with identifying ideas, validating them, and then allowing for that quick, quick kill experiment to run through to see, does this actually make sense to pursue? Uh, so, Ty, could you yes. uh, just back up a little bit? Um, yeah. We use, I mean, I've had experience with Ty and others in other venues but I just want to point out that, you know, for the people who are graphically challenged, like how do I draw a storyboard? It, I mean, you could you could do stick figures, you could do really basic stuff, but there are also off-the-shelf programs that create very sophisticated graphics like this. So can you just mention what they are and where to find them? Yeah, sure. Well, and if I think if you put the right prompts in. Uh, with the most recent release of ChatGPT4, it's got the uh, Dolly Im like uh, generative imaging tool baked into it. So if you put the right prompts in, then you can get it to generate storyboards for you. Um, I did this recently where you know I sat down with my 90-year-old grandmother and asked her to tell me a story. And so I did a transcription of it, loaded that transcript into ChatGPT, and then it told a story of our family history. And then I asked it to illustrate key points in the story and it developed these beautiful images that emerged from it. So being able to get to results like this is surprisingly efficient. So, and it also can be a, like a quick visual you can use to validate or invalidate your ideas because in order to get to this point, it's, you have to go through a pretty severe BS filter uh, because you're having to make choices of exactly what the shape of things are in order to visually represent it. And it, it's also a good way to test whether or not you have thought things through well enough to present an idea to somebody versus just using like, you know, the words here on the, on the side here of like, it should be simple, operate, easy to interpret, don't cause risk to the patient, be portable. Well, that is less descriptive than what we have here, which is telling a story through visuals where you can more quickly get to what the real value of this is. Um, so Trig also is a, a team of professional designers. So we create, prepare these illustrations for our clients. Oftentimes we're working with surgeons to help them to illustrate, you know, a new, um, say cardiothoracic surgical instrument that then gets licensed and that kind of thing. So this is part of our bread and butter as well as designers. So, okay. Uh, so, I think the other interesting thing is when we design thinking in its origins comes from physical goods, which is where the field of industrial design came from, which you think about like the Studebaker Avanti, uh, you know, where you or streamlined trains in the 1940s and 50s. And so those physical goods then jumped over to software user interfaces where you think of the iPhone and that translation into that space. And so then over time, it's then we've taken what's worked in the software user interface and then tried to apply that to behavioral interventions where we're not changing the software or the hardware, but rather the experience of interacting with the environment. And then fully, I think the, the 
the frontier in which we're seeing design thinking really be applied is in complex system design, where if you make a change over here, it affects five things over here. And so you want to be very careful with how you make changes within complex systems. And also you want to understand the interactions between each of those so that you're making uh, changes that don't disrupt the whole system and get you um, ejected like a virus out of the entire ecosystem. So it's interesting to kind of see how these different approaches start to apply, start to apply when the origins of some of the techniques that have worked date back to say the 1940s or so. Okay. So also just before we go any further as a disclaimer, uh, so if you're experiencing a life-threatening medical emergency, do not attempt design thinking. Put down the sticky notes and call 911. Do not use design thinking to plan your daily commute to work. Design thinking is not a substitute for actual thinking. Design thinking does not replace having a trained designer on your team who has a track record of shipping products. Do not attempt design thinking without a supervision from a member of the GSD club. The GSD club is exclusive to those who get shit done. Arlen Myers is the founding member of the GSD club. Side effects of design thinking may include tinkering, obnoxious curiosity, enjoying your work, productive play, and obsessive compulsive attention to problems that otherwise ignored. Now that we have that disclaimer out of the place, we can proceed. Okay. So from a complex design thinking process where we're dealing with complex systems, uh, the training process we go through is try to make sure we have an uh, elaborate approach to this. So this is high level of complexity in terms of how design thinking can systematically approach that in terms of journey mapping, empathy statements, need statements, organizing all of that through levels of alignment, which ultimately wraps up our empathy module. So there's a lot of sophisticated tools here that can be brought to bear to really make sure we understand that first value judgment of what is desirable. And then in terms of creativity, there's a lot of really uh, fun, advanced techniques for boosting your personal creativity, and then also seeing how that plays out in a team environment. So that's part and parcel of the training that we offer at TRIG. Okay. So now I wanna get into a, more of a discussion in the realm of empathy first AI. And the image that I've got here is a roundabout, which I think if you've run across these, this is either frustrating for you or makes you happy. But you think about in the design of systems, I think we oftentimes have a choice of putting in place traffic lights versus roundabouts. So with traffic lights, it's much more of an authoritarian, we're going to tell you when you can, when it's safe for you to go. And the traffic light is assuming responsibility for the safety of everybody involved. Whereas with a roundabout, we're allowing for local decision-making to make a best choice so that determine whether or not it's safe to proceed. And so as a design consideration, I personally prefer to make sure that we're um, instituting roundabouts as a value judgment, as opposed to traffic lights that we're allowing for uh, individual autonomy and sovereignty, as opposed to centralized control and planning. So just as an overall approach to this, like we want to uh, make sure we're maintaining the dignity and self-sovereignty of each individual physician, patient, clinician that's involved in healthcare. And so just as an overall design consideration here, just wanted to touch on this as something to ask ourselves at a, each, each decision point, is this a traffic light or is this a roundabout? Because I think that, that decision pops up in the design of healthcare innovation. Okay. There's a recent example, and this is a good example. Uh, the point I want to make is that roundabouts and traffic engineering can uh, lead people to make the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. So that the downside of this is people want to be told what to do. You're right. It as a behavioral mechanism, it better to let people make up their own mind. The problem is they make the wrong decision. Now, part of I'm not blaming people, everybody for making because we had this recent example in Denver where they decided that uh, they were going to redo a street to allow more bike paths. Mm -hmm. So they created this cockamamie scheme. And I could go into depth on it, but basically the na the neighborhood went crazy when they got it done because it was so screwed up. It led people to make the wrong decisions. It was so confusing, the signs and the paths and the separation of the street from the bike path. It, it really was a really bad idea and they had to essentially redo it. So my point is, yeah, it's a good idea, but like everything else, there's always the sort of unintended consequence. Mm-hmm. Sure. Go ahead, Sri. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to add is when 
for centralized control, for example, they can see the big picture that you cannot see locally, correct? So is there a possibility of having a hybrid model where you have a degree of centralized control because they can see the 30,000 feet picture that you can't see at the roundabout? Well, and I think the, and that actually leads to the, the framework I wanted us to play with here, which is trying to balance both, I guess, the, I guess, system level control to reduce error and the local autonomy to, you know, based within your own human cognition limitations, be set up to make the best decision possible. So I mean, Arlen, to your point, like if you've got a, a bike lane that has the biker sneaking up on the blind spot of the driver, that's a bad system level design that puts the individual autonomy and limitations of the driver um, in a harm's way versus like trying to make sure you deeply understand each, each stakeholder as they're engaging with the system you've put in place but also to um, try to make sure, try to set people up to make the right decision in that context. Because the, you know, one of the design considerations with roundabouts is that they have, I think it is at a quarter of the possible error locations compared to uh, traffic lights. That with the traffic light systems, there's just as many possible, there's a, like four times as many possible error states. And so you're reducing those possibilities of error. So it's also, it's, you know, so anyway, not to get into like traffic design here, but just from a principle standpoint, you're thinking about kind of total system design and what's the best way to approach it. Uh, so another point to make here is I think particularly with AI or blockchain or quantum computing, where we're trying to figure out how to interpret this new technology that we're all being confronted with, it's very easy to react in a technology push way where you've got a technology solution and we start running around trying to find stakeholder problems. So this is the classic NIH or National Science Foundation bench to bedside model. And so with a design thinking approach for an empathy first approach, we wanna start with a proprietary understanding of what is happening at the bedside. What are those stakeholder problems that would benefit from technology solutions, but also leave, leave ourselves open to the possibility that the best solution might be to remove technology from the situation. It's only from empathy for the stakeholder where we were able to allow ourselves that option. And so that's just something I wanna to continue to push because it's very easy, and I've been involved in a lot of robotic surgical instruments. It's very easy to clutter the OR with one more robot when you know, like you just don't need that many robots in order to just be able to allow local control for the surgical team. So anyway, just different considerations there with market pull versus technology push. Uh, so, um, and Dr. Myers has been a guest on the Med Design podcast, and we've been interviewing physician entrepreneurs. And so this has been something that has come up as a frequent topic with some of our speakers, where we've been looking at um, you know kind of different approaches to applying AI to healthcare where they see the potential for improving patient education and outcomes, but also trying to make sure we don't try to replace human professionals with this. And there was one with uh, Dr. Stephen Charlop. Uh, he's the founder of SOAP, S-O-A-P, not to be confused with S-O-P-E. Uh, but he's been working in the AI space for years, and he's also been looking at, basically, can AI be used to help patients be able to be more um, reveal more about their patient history in preparation for a meeting with their physician, an appointment with their physician. And so it's fascinating to see they are actually arriving at better health outcomes because the patients were more willing to reveal sensitive topics about their, their history to a chatbot and then have it synthesized back to the doctor. So the doctor in the 10, 15 minutes they have with them can prioritize what it is they can, uh, they can be talking about during that appointment. So it's a neat application of the technology that um, he seems to be timing the market really well, as given that he's been working on it for several years prior to the hype cycle uh, reaching its, its zenith where we are right now. I want to make a comment uh, as in relation to what you just described and specifically the three people that are on this, uh, on this slide. I want to caution people that there is a difference between an idea, an improvement, an innovation a technology and a business. So when you move along that pathway, 
back to the previous slide of bench to bedside to to uh, back to you know to to the bedside. Um, it's an it's a bigger step to go from bedside to boardroom. So you can demonstrate a whole bunch of stuff clinic. I mean, it's a two sided coin. You do stuff in the boardroom that hasn't been demonstrated clinically, and you demonstrate stuff clinically that does not have a place in the boardroom. It's not a business. So you can do all the happy talk you want about how you're improving this, this, and that, but there's so many other factors that go into whether it's a viable business. I, I just want to caution people about that because people get crazy when they say, well, you really haven't clinically validated your idea. Well, there's a lot of stuff that we use that hasn't been clinically validated, like aspirin, that made an enormous amount of money. So th they're different. They're just different ways of, of progressing. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, yeah, that's yeah, I'll, I'll I'll leave that uh, let that comment stand. <laughs> okay. Um. So one of the so in in uh, Ben Schneiderman's work, human centered AI, um, this concept I found to be really fascinating, and getting back to applications of AI. And so in the early days of looking at AI, I think there was a common belief that more automation was better and designers had to thereby reduce human control. So as you move the slider along of less human control going towards more computer automation, like more traffic lights, that like this was actually a false dichotomy. Rather, we want to do is approach more from a two-dimensional standpoint as you've basically, and this gets back to Sri's question from earlier, if you've got high human control, low human control, and then high computer automation, low computer automation. And so a goal would be to move from activities that are maybe low tech or highly labor dependent, and then move upwards and to the right in terms of reliable, safe, and trustworthy, so that you have humans in the group and AI in the loop. Uh, so examples of this uh, that, you know, he provides is, um, say, for example, pain control designs. Uh, so a low tech, low automation, low human control might just be a morphine drip bag. We say, good luck. We're just going to you know, fill you up with morphine and we're going to hopefully get the, the flow uh, correct. And then on a high level of human control, maybe you've got a patient guided dispenser. And then from a computer control standpoint, maybe you've got something that's an automatic dispenser where you have fully programmed in everything about uh, patient safety into this computer control, and it's going to make the decisions. If it gets it wrong, it's a system level design. And so then the ideal goal for this is a patient guided and clinic clinician monitored system so that you're allowing the patient to provide local inputs to what degree of pain control they'd like to access but also there's a clinician monitoring to make sure that the patient doesn't make the wrong decision and do something that's life-threatening to them. And so having that level of balance between computer control, human control, enablement of experts to be able to make sure that it's in the right place, it's a good example of kind of how to approach this from a couple of different angles. Uh, so as an exercise, what I'd like for us to consider is uh, applying some of these concepts in the mural board. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an exercise here in a little bit, but also give you an example of maybe say how large language model might be approached. And so um, particularly from the you know, standpoint of say like electronic health records. Uh, so the low tech labor dependent is kind of our historical paper notes uh, that has, you know, you have the bad the notorious bad doctor handwriting, which seems to have gone away with electronic health records, right? Um, but that was like the, 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 the history, historical trope. And so then you think about like, well, we've got high human control, then some of the capabilities there might just be spell check, where you've got a couple of like light AI tools to help make sure that to help catch spelling errors, but you're not actually engaging with the, the human inputs. And so if you've played with God mode, which uh, is basically you set up an API to your chat GPT, and you run a script to let ChatGPT just, you give it an overall like goal of say like, you know, like take over the world and then run the command and then let the AI just run until it takes over the world. Now, the thing about that is I've tried. Um, 
<laughs> is that without human input, the chat GPT just gets dumber and dumber. Like it just continues to do self-referential loops and it can't actually achieve what's, you know, like what it's, you know, uh, touted as in God mode. So it's fun to play with, but um, you're not going to be taking over the world anytime soon. Sorry to say. So what I think is interesting, though, is you know, kind of what we talked about with uh, Dr. Stephen Charlop is that you know, maybe there's something along the lines of natural language in order to take us, uh, allow the patient to input their truth into a survey in a natural chat mode. But then that's also in a secured modality so that it then goes into a trusted doctor patient conversation to enable a more forthcoming and better diagnosis of that. So that's something that's an interesting outcome of being able to use large language models in a way that's reliable, safe, and trustworthy. We're not just um, abdicating to the chat GPT gods, and we're also not fully relying on just the skill of each individual because, you know, you're the lowest person to graduate from medical school is still a doctor. And so you've got an array of different skill levels in the healthcare environment. And so having some degree of check and background and understanding so that we're trying to offer better um, consistent experiences, I think there's a there's a, a higher aim for this. Okay, so now I wanna get into the exercise and we're at 936. So we're gonna give ourselves about 10 minutes for this exercise. So what I'd like for you to do is, and we're kind of playing with this overall problem statement, which is, and I've, I've pulled, that I'm very intentional about the writing of this problem statement. So the job of keeping a record of a patient's medical history often conflicts with delivering care to the patient. So even prior to electronic health records, there was still that, you know, challenge of the paper record and, you know, kind of uh, transmissibility from one office to the other. And so there's challenges with the old system, there's challenges with the new system, but that overall job of keeping a record of patient's medical history conflicting with delivering care to the patient. So what I'd like for you to do, and I'll show you what I had done before, is in preparation for this, is go to say ChatGPT, and I, what I'd like for you to do is to drop in a prompt into ChatGPT. And actually, I'm going to go to the one that's, well, actually, here. Um, I will give you the first one in the series, which is go ahead and drop this into your own ChatGPT and start training your chat model. And then the results of which. I then want you to go through and then in the mural board, add a sticky note, and then out of what the chat GPT model generates for you, take the one that you think is interesting and then drop it here into the mural board. So we'll start with the low human control, low computer automation prompt that I've dropped in here in the chat. And then you can find the rest of the prompts over here to the side. So list historical solutions to and quote the problem where low human control and low computer automation have been applied. So is everybody clear on what we're doing? No, okay. Um, Maria, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so can you please repeat the instructions one more time? <laughs> yes, okay. So first, I hope you're logged into Mural. Are you there? Okay, all right, good, as a visitor. Okay, now I'd like you to go over to whether it's ChatGPT, if you have access or kind of whatever your favorite large language model. And then I'd like for you to drop, drop this prompt in, list historical solutions too, and then I've got the problem statement quoted where low human control and low uh, computer automation have been applied. So we'll hit go on that. And then we're just going to watch the magic happen. If, if there's a confusion, can you just put the chosen answer in chat GPT in the chat? Will that work? But it's still going. I gave the prompt and it's writing. Yeah, which is fun to see that, right? Yeah. And so, Ty, it seems like you're using chat GPT 4. 
Mm -hmm. I tried uh, chat GPT 3.5 and the answer is different from the one that I'm seeing on your screen. Oh yeah. And it should be. I see. Okay. And so mm -hmm. how do I incorporate that into the mural board? Whatever feedback I got my right. answer of choice. Right. So let's take, um, I don't know, like for here, I'm going to, I think this is a key part of the workflow that mm -hmm. using chat GPT, I think is the key part of it that is helpful to understand. And so I just went through and copied like index card systems. Like that's a good one to just set as a baseline. So now I'm going to set up a sticky note over here and I'm just going to drop that in as a example of low human control, low human tech, right? I see. Let me try and that. so we just want to drop in a couple of sticky notes. And so the, and the exercise here too is that um, ChatGPT and other large language models solve the blank canvas problem, which is, I don't know where to start and like writing down on a blank sheet of paper is hard. And so particularly for people who are better at editing rather than generating ideas, this is particularly helpful because what you might find is that the responses that get generated oftentimes are more creative than what the individual uh, will come up with. And so it'll give you things to think about that you probably would have spent two hours to get to that level of, uh, I guess, completeness on a list. And so just that's the exercise is just to grab one of these from your chat GPT model or whichever one you're using, and then to drop it in here as a sticky note. But how do you drop it? So yeah, I- that's what I'm having trouble with. Yeah, this is- uh, Okay, uh, so it's uh, so you do paste, so copy paste, control V, control V. Right, control I copy paste it into a sticky note, but how do I put the sticky note onto the canvas? Oh, uh, let's see, where are you? I'm gonna try to find Arlen. Color. Here we go. So I'm gonna follow Arlen. Where are you? Okay, so two inscribes, right? So how do I get that into where you want me to put it? Okay, so it looks like we've got a couple here. All right, so within a sticky note, you double click into the sticky note and then you paste into it. So you have to get it to where you're editing the sticky note. Okay, so in reference to human-centered AI, it seems to me that this platform <laughs> is not intuitive. It depends on, I think for one of the things we do when we're using this platform is to try to get people familiar with it so that yeah. when we're doing work in it, that it's right. a good interface. Right. Yeah, no, reason? it's a great tool. It just requires some education how to use right. it. Right, exactly. Um, the benefits of this are that, um, you know, if you've ever been to an in-person ideation session where you've got Right. physical sticky notes everywhere, then right. they all get rolled up into a package and then nobody actually ever references it again. And they just sit somewhere until some, some poor hapless person has to transcribe it. Right. So we start by having everybody digitally input everything to start. And then that allows for a more robust workspace that you can come back to later. Or say when um, uh, Harvey joins later from his note taking, and he said Rick, he has FOMO on this. He can join the the mural board and catch up and start applying it. So yeah. anyway, if if Harvey's listening in on this, so. yeah. <laughs> okay. well, actually, yeah, okay, yeah. So we're at seven forty three, right? Uh, so now, what I'd like to do. So now that we've gotten some. So Ty, I wanted to ask you one question at this point. Sorry to interrupt you. I've done this kind of exercise previously with the consulting service on public health emergencies, hmm. the California Council of Science and Technology. It was basically about messaging during public health emergencies and finding the intersection where uh, privacy concerns are overridden, uh, where population health or an emergency is concerned versus um, uh, patients not uh, sort of giving access to their medical records. But the point is, once I don't remember the name of the tool they used, but what that tool was able to do was capture a summarized version of all of the sticky notes that were put there, mm -hmm. just in case the discussion got too big and people wanted to get the the summary. Can we do something like that with the mural board as well? 
Uh, the mural board itself, not so much. Um, for the problem you're describing, what I would do is take the transcription, maybe it's from Harvey's transcription or uh, what Arlen has captured here. I would pull it into Descript and then from there, then use an AI tool to then go through and generate that. So it's not native to Mural. Um, Mural is first and foremost a, a digital whiteboard. Uh, but there's a couple of different ways to approach that. But no, it's a three. It's a good observation to like, you know, how to provide a summar summarization of notes. And I think Zoom might have that natively now. It's interesting to kind of see how that problem is being addressed by a couple of different software packages. Because at this point here, say Harvey, who's not on the call, wants to go through it. He'll have to go through all of these sticky notes first. And sometimes when you have that summarized version, it's a quick overview before you actually go through all of those individual sticky notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it helps to have um, uh, at least have segments where people are working from, say, a workspace like this, where you're collectively generating ideas and then have a, to your point, a summarization of it, or we call it synthesis and convergence, where you're combining like ideas because what will often happen is like if you have a group of 10 people all ideating then there's going to be similar ideas that pop up of like hey we should have an app for our iphone because everybody has an iphone in front of them then like you know that idea is going to pop up and you can cluster all of them together um we've been using it doing that as a manual process um because i do think there's some editing and editorial decisions that come with that as opposed to just passively allowing a, a, a summary that where you haven't actually worked with it because there's also the intent of what somebody says that's implicit as opposed to the explicit transcription of an idea. And so I think there's a, a balance to strike there of how much do you give up to AI versus like continue to have human input to. I think it's no, just a matter of like, where do you want to prioritize your time, so. No, 100% right. Yeah. yeah. So Ty, how do you, factor in the complex systems problem in other wow. words in other words you know and let's take soap.health as an example mm -hmm. um because i'm familiar with that platform and in fact work with steven uh oh, yeah. the, the the point is uh so what sound i mean it's this old it sounded like a good idea at the time we're going to basically use ambient AI to extract what's going on in the in the examining room and convert mm -hmm. voice to text and put it in a note in a SOAP format. Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea. Uh, but uh, that may work for an individual physician in an individual specialty in an individual practice situation, not for an independent primary care doc in a rural hospital. So my point is, and all of the operations that have to go into actually actualizing that, particularly from a billing and collection standpoint, because mm -hmm. that's really what this is about. This is a revenue cycle management tool. It's it may be it's a quality improvement tool, but we're also skeptical about electronic medical records. We look at it as a billing tool. So my point is, there's so many stakeholders with different needs who want different value propositions. And when you squeeze on the balloon in one place, the problem pops out in another. So it's a complex system engineering problem. Yes, it is. So how do you work through all that in an attempt to sort of what you just demonstrated, simplify and aggregate and converge all the ideas because one size does not suit all. Right. And that's, um, so part of that, and I'll share my screens. This is the, the, the kind of core of our course, which the first thing is just scoping the problem where you can't solve all of the problems for all of the people and have anything that's not just, you know, oatmeal, right? So it's kind of bland. Nobody likes it. Nobody hates it. It just kind of does the like everywhere versus trying to be. And so it's a wandering generality rather if we can narrow down the scope to be a meaningful specific. So Arlen, you just listed off, say like, let's provide a tool that helps rural clinic clinics to be able to operate and within their resource limitations. That is a tractable problem. And so part of this is making sure you're doing a really great job narrowing down your scope. And so as we start teams off on these really complex areas, 
we ask them to first identify all of the stakeholders who would be affected. And then within that, like, do you understand the problem well enough to identify subgroups who will be most affected and sub problems? And then, um, you know, kind of key moments in time where the pain is most acute. And then do you understand the context well enough for this to then get to a, histor a historical understanding of what happened? And then the big, so what? Why would people care if we solve this problem? So as part of this, we actually have a gate here of if you can't answer the problem well enough to where you understand the subgroup that's most affected by this, and then the specific pain points that are most acute, then you should not proceed. Rather, you should go out and do some more customer interviews, build your empathy, make sure you deeply understand the problem before you go any further in this. If you've cleared all of these checks and you have actually gone through and talked to people or you have enough expertise to be able to go forward, then we start going into, say, our empathy content, which is going through and doing a journey mapping exercise where we list out each of the steps that happen at a programmatic level. But then what happens for each of the stakeholders at each moment in time in that process? so that each of those stakeholders is clearly identified and one person's experience, the patient's experience is gonna be different from the nurse's experience, is gonna be different from the physician's experience, is gonna be exist different from the payer's experience. And just mapping each of those pain points and frustrations really helps to say temporarily where are the problems happening. And then as you identify those problems, particularly if you make two sets of stakeholders mad at the same time, that's usually where your opportunities reside. And so then you go through and you list out basically what's the current situation, the conflict, and that stakeholder's ideal solution. That then gets to where we're mapping those need statements, which is kind of one of the key skills that isn't taught well enough and yet is also one of the biggest value adds for any program. Because if you have a clear articulation of what the need is, that's solution-free, it's scoped, it's specific, it has a metric that, and also is somewhat poetic. So you think about, you know, Steve Jobs was brilliant at this. Like his need statement he marketed around was a thousand songs in your pocket. And so if you can get down to that level of specificity about what the problem is, so that any solution you come up with can address that, I think that's kind of the level of work that happens to then identify where that needs to happen. And then you start to organize those because it's not just one need statement for one stakeholder, but it's multiple stakeholders. And so based upon each of those stakeholder needs that you map out, they converge to a singular vision. And so by going through this process, then you can take each of those prioritized needs and then run specific creative sprints based upon each of those. So in the teaching case study we use is, uh, you know, canine vets need a less intimidating way to identify dental abnormalities during a general physical exam. And so then we break out each of those need statements and ask people to generate ideas based upon this. And so you're able to organize across a lot of different, you know, com complex need statements, uh, kind of how you can go about approaching that. So anyway, that's just kind of a quick run through of uh, Arlen to answer your question of how we manage that complexity because one need statement over here is going to also affect something that may conflict for another stakeholder and how do you balance that? And so we actually had a, a innovation project we were working on where one of the need statements we identified actually turned out to be something we needed to disregard because if we solved for another need statement at a different point in the process, then that other need statement just went away because we were using a different part of the process in order to solve for what we thought was the most acute pain point, but rather it could have been preempted by shifting our focus to another point in the journey. All right, Sri, uh, go ahead. Yeah, Ty, I had just one question. Uh -huh. Sometimes when you're trying to balance all of these needs and try to get some common theme running across mm -hmm. that doesn't undercut the needs of one versus the other, the solution may not be that valuable, right? So how do you balance the needs to the point where even if you don't mitigate the needs for across for everybody, you at least prioritize some needs. For example, uh, in, in, in some innovation, the patient-centric part of it is perhaps more valuable than um, the needs of somebody else. Do you get into those situations? Have you seen those? And how do you address that? 
That is such a strategic and local optimization question, right? Where you're you're trying to make a value judgment really about kind of which of these pain points is most interesting to your goals as an innovator, your organization's goals. And so that's, I think you're, you're talking about the overall like strategic decisions. And oftentimes that's as much a reflection of the culture of either the startup founder or the organization that you work within. And that bundle of value judgments of which patient to prioritize, which stakeholder group to prioritize is very much, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural and a strategic decision. And how we go about making those decisions is really where the design aspect comes in and um, making sure we're hopefully making the right decisions there. Well, so, part of it, yeah, yeah. Uh, we just actually heard a recent example of this, and that is when you're trying to do AI project management in a healthcare situation, and you're the IT person or you're the director of whatever that's responsible for essentially running the, I, the AI shop in your hospital call it what you want. Uh, what this individual, and he gave se several examples of this, and but the point was they were very specific about here are the ideas we are going to prioritize, whether it's process, operations, revenue cycle management, clinical problems. They were very specific about what, here are the problems that are our priorities here are the results we expect and the way we're going to measure them, inappropriate ER readmissions, prolonged length of stay, complications, burnout, workforce turnover, et cetera, et cetera. They were very specific about what, th these are the things we're going to look at. If you're doing something else, don't even bother to, to come to this thing. Um, so I think the answer to the question is, and this overlaps into project management, because once you go through this exercise and you identify, okay, here's what we're going to do, then you got to get shit done. So that's project management. And, and that's a whole nother lecture and another one of these things, which is all very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, my, final, my final question is, uh, I mean, this is an example of the Kruger-Dunning effect. Like you don't know what you don't know about design thinking. This is pretty complicated and comprehensive and obviously reflects long-term professional approach and experience. Where do I start? Like, is, is there a design thinking light or do you have to do the whole enchilada to get this right? Uh, wow, that's such a good question. Maybe we can uh, go from there. And Maria, I also want to answer your question about how I'm defining empathy too. Um, <clears throat> So design thinking is something that your freshman year as a design student, you start to engage with and you continue as a professional designer, you continue to learn and practice throughout your career. So the principles of it are something that it's relatively quick to get up to speed and understand some of the concept flips that need to happen in order to start engaging empirically with your workplace. Uh, but the skill and the creative performance of practitioners grows over time. And so one of the things that's entertaining is you'll see this where like executive MBA programs will offer a design thinking course. And it's almost like it's an inoculation of like, we're going to get deliver a dead virus of what design thinking is. And people come away with an impression of it as a five-step process. And if we do the five-step process and it doesn't work, then design thinking doesn't work. If you think about design thinking, though, as empiricism, trial and error, what we're really saying is we tried trial and error and trial and error didn't work. Which, you know, like, you, know you think about like what you're saying with that. So it, it's something that you can engage in limited scope, hour and a half, two hour sprints where you participate in it. But being able to be a leader in, in this field of empirical creativity is one where you have the confidence to and the courage to see it through when the inevitable shit hits the fan. And it's it's almost like archetypal for every design project of, you know, you think it's going to go great and then your prototype breaks or, you know, people don't like it. 
but there's a valuable nugget that you learn from and you go back down again. And like, then eventually you start to actually find value finally with perseverance, courage, and commitment. And I think that's ultimately what it takes to engage in this kind of empiricism because there isn't that guarantee of success except for having the commitment to be able to see it through and learn from those mistakes and be able to seek value as a result of applying these tools. So maybe that's a good place for us to wrap up. Uh, I had a lot more I wanted to share, but uh, the discussion was the most valuable part. So thank yeah, you. This was this was great, but just we have one more where uh, just to answer Maria's question yes. again. Oh, what's sorry. what's yeah. the definition of empathy? So empathy is being able to put yourself in the shoes of other people. And it's not sympathy, rather it's being able to try to understand how are people engaging with this particular problem space such that you can understand what their point of view are and limitations and also those frustration points so that you can start to solve for those problems. And so we're fundamentally asking that question of what is desirable for each of the stakeholders. And until we walk a mile in their shoes, we won't be able to pragmatically understand that. And I really do think that design without empathy is malpractice. Yeah, this is great. Uh, thanks for being a Sherpa on our trail off Mount Stupid. And uh, this is great. I've it many times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And we'll see you next time. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, Ty. Appreciate it.